Okay, um, all right, let's crack on. There's a few more people coming in. <coughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. So, you'll have heard a lot of sessions about Triple Eight today, I'm sure. Um, that's what everyone's talking about, not surprisingly. So, this session is something that I originally presented in Drupal Camp Scotland in about November. And it was really about whilst Drupal 8 is now in full release, when's it, when's it actually sensible to, to be actually creating, uh, actually using it for real, real projects? And I, I do this from the perspective of, of my life. Um, so I'm the technical director of ICOS, which is a, uh, a Drupal agency that special, uh, basically an agency, web agency that specializes in Drupal. So we've been doing Drupal since the early, well, late Drupal 6, early Drupal 7. Um, so we've been through this transition once before. So what this is about, you know, my perspective on things is about we build lots of large-scale enterprise kind of sites. Uh, we, we, uh, we do corporate sites. So my perspective on it is maybe slightly different from, from other people. So what I want to go through with you today is a little bit of history. A little bit of a history lesson in Drupal. Um, talking about how things went when we went from 6 to 7 and how we can use that experience uh, on, on this occasion. So we're going to look at what's different now than, than we had when we went from 6 to 7. And then finally, one thing that we're doing internally is looking at the risk versus reward of whether to do Drupal 8 or, or Drupal 7 when we're looking at new projects. So to start with, we want to look a little bit about the history, um, what happened when we went to Drupal 7 full release. And this was in January 2011, if any of you have been around with us that long. Um, but when we, when we launched Drupal 7, great, lovely launch parties. Uh, the one in London was hosted by Microsoft. It was, it was a lovely event. But most of the contrib and the community modules weren't actually ready for us. So actually putting sites out in Drupal 7 was not actually practical at that point in time. So it wasn't until uh, the views module got to a release candidate that we had mainstream adoption uh, of Drupal 7. Now, this is really not easy to see, um, so we're going to zoom in a little bit. So what this shows you is a timeline of uh, Drupal's launch, which is up here, January, and it shows you, I've picked a selection of modules that we use all the time, that are sort of mainstream modules, things like WYSIWYG, Google Analytics, Path Auto Views, Drupal Commerce, uh, Rules, and so on. And these modules, the, the yellow indicates when they went to release candidate, and the blue indicates when they went to full release. So what you can see here is, even though Drupal 7 came out in 2011, Views wasn't ready, even in release candidate, until July. And then later on that, was another year before we had the date module, for example, in full release candidate. So whilst those were all usable, in betas and alphas and devs and everything else, certain types of uh, site, you just don't want to be launching on unstable alpha versions of things. And if you take it even further, features wasn't ready for us until 20, uh, July 2012. And if you're really picky about it, the entity module, which is used by a lot of other, uh, a lot of other modules within Drupal, wasn't even out until January 2013 in full release. That didn't mean you couldn't use it, but if your policy is no betas, then you weren't going to be using Drupal 7 for two years. So this one is the same sort of thing, but this is showing you just those release candidates. If you feel like you're being a bit more risky um, here, so you can see that really we were looking at, again, March before we got to sort of release candidates of these modules. And that was reflected in this particular graph, which is one of WebChicks, uh, which is showing the uh, Drupal 7 adoption. When people started using Drupal 7 from the launch, which is down here, and then it started to cross over from the Drupal, it started to overtake Drupal 6 just after Views came out, which is not a big surprise because Views was, was the thing that was everyone was waiting for. And a bit bigger. And then, as you can see, Drupal 6 starts to tail off and Drupal 7 adoption goes up. So what can we learn from this? Um, well, mainly it was six months 
from Drupal 7's official launch before we were seeing a large scale adoption of Drupal 7. And it was a year before we started to see Drupal 7 overtaking Drupal 6. There were also 10 point releases in the first year, which is uh, not, not that surprising. So that's sort of the step changes and maintenance updates that were made. So we're going to take that little history lesson and then apply that to today. Uh, where we are right now is Drupal 8 has been released. It hadn't been when I first did this talk, but it has now. And what's different? Is, is, this, si is this cycle going to repeat itself? And in order to understand that a little bit more, this, you know, we need to understand what changed between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Now, I'm sure probably most of you know this, but I'll just quickly recap. So we, we in introduced in 2011 this thing called the Drupal 8 Initiatives, which was adding some functionality to the Drupal core that didn't exist before. And these were uh, configuration management, HTML5 support, uh, layout support, mobile support, multilingual, bringing that views, the very important views module into core, and also making uh, Drupal much more of a web services kind of platform. So Drupal 7 had so much of a dependency on uh, these small number of core committers that you know, Drew made the decision to, to change things a little bit. And a couple of these initiatives are uh, the, the Whiskey initiative, Web Services and Context Core initiative, was about making Drupal 8 more about web services as, as opposed to, a, to what it was to evolve, which is very page centric. And I'm sure you've probably heard all that stuff by now, but there's a reference down there about when that happened. And one of the other most important things was the configuration management initiative that happened. Before we were using the features module to store all that configuration in code, and it, it wasn't really what it was intended for, um, but we, we made it work somehow. And so this was configuration management was a, was a proper solution to storing Drupal's configuration. So the, the modules that I'm, you know, you know there's a thousand modules in Drupal, and Everyone uses different ones, but ultimately there are some perennials that we see every single time. So these are the ones that, for the sake of argument in this session that I'm talking about, um, those, these were the ones that we, that we were looking at the life cycle of. So Views WYSIWYG C tools, which is a supporting uh, module for views. The date module Path Auto, features, commerce, Google Analytics, and rules, panels, tokens, and those sort of things. So when you look at Drupal 8, you can cross off loads of those because they're all were brought into core. So we have WYSIWYG in core, we have views, we have uh, a plugin management system which is used instead of C tools. Date is in core. Configuration management replaces features completely. Entity, which nearly got into core in seven anyway, is definitely in core in eight. So that, that takes 50% of our dependencies away. So we're already in a better place when, when we get to Drupal 8 release, we're already in a much better place than we ever were uh, in Drupal 7. So all of those things that, that allow us to, to be a step forward on the day of release. <coughs> so what about those other 50%? Well, what you'll see now is if you go to Drupal org, you'll see this message a lot. Um, this, this is going to appear on a module page. And this module has a pre-release version. If you don't see that, and it's a module you want, then you've got, you know, you've got a bit of trouble, because that probably means no one's working on it. So not every module is going to be ported to Drupal 8. Some of them are not necessary anymore. Um, but when you see that, you'll know at least someone's working on it. So looking at those ones that I, can, I pulled out as the important ones, so something like Drupal Commerce. We, we do lots of work in Drupal Commerce uh, at ICOS. And you know, there is a new version, uh, Drupal Commerce 2, which has been rewritten completely for Drupal 8, uh, and that's now at Alpha 3, so very much getting there. Um, again, when I first did this talk, it wasn't even on the horizon, that Alpha 3, so we're, we're a significant step uh, further along. But Drupal Commerce also has its own little mini ecosystem of plugins that uh, help Drupal Commerce work, things like payment gateways and coupons and stuff like that. So all of that stuff also needs to catch up. So not only have you got commerce waiting for core, you've got contributed commerce waiting for commerce to come out. So you've got this double step delay. And we've got the rules module, one of the most complex modules 
that there is. Um, there was a fundraising initiative so that uh, Wolfgang, who's, who's the, the original maintainer, um, could basically be employed to get this thing done. Um, that was partially successful, um, not 100%, but pretty good. And as far as I know, when I last checked, which was last night, we are still waiting for the UI part of rules to come, in, um, come into play. So again, moving on well, but of course you're reliant on people's volunteer time. So you can't necessarily uh, project exactly when these things are going to happen. Then we have panels. Uh, we don't use panels that much in our site, but it's obviously it's used very, very often for, uh, for, for layout. Not all of the panels initiative, uh, sorry, the, the blocks initiative in core managed to make it through. So we still need a really good layout option for Drupal 8. So panels itself is in beta 4. And we, we are actually using different approaches now, things like paragraphs, which are also in, in late betas uh, in Drupal 8. So in summary, the main thing that's different this time is that there's so much more stuff in Drupal core that we used to have to wait for. <coughs> and we don't have to wait just for quite as long as for the community stuff to catch up with us. And just to illustrate that, uh, Drupal 7 core had 40 modules in, uh, Drupal 8 has 61. So, you know, it's gone a, it's gone a long way. <coughs> Excuse me. But, there's something else going on at the moment that you need to keep an eye on. So, you'll see this symbol, and maybe you've seen this as well. Uh, the Lightning Project and the Drupal 8 Module Acceleration Program, program uh, are both initiatives by Acquia. Under the... Uh, John Kennedy is, uh, is running those programs. John Kennedy used to be one of our UK communities, now moved out to the States. <coughs> The idea of the Drupal 8 Module Acceleration Program is to fund the acceleration of, I think they've called it the top 50, the top 50 modules that are out there that haven't yet been ported. They are putting money into that. So that's one thing that's going on. And the other thing is the Lightning uh, distribution. So if you have a look at Project Lightning on Drupal.org, what that is, is pretty much all those modules built into a distribution for Drupal 8. Um, it could be a demo framework, it could be something else, it could be a base distribution for things you work on, but ultimately it's a driver to get those modules ready for production. So Acquia, I don't know whether they're building projects on it, but they're certainly, um, it's certainly something you can get a hold of. And if nothing else, it's a really good reference point to look at the modules they've decided to put in it. It might influence your decision as to what you use. <coughs> So, the other alternatives, when we've got a situation, because we've now got Symfony, uh, a Symfony framework in Drupal, what is happening is people are taking slightly different approaches to module development. And what we're seeing is, uh, I think Commerce Guys in Drupal Commerce 2 was the first example that I saw, where there's a tendency now to build these independent PHP libraries using Symfony or other, other frameworks and then to build your Drupal module wrapping around those libraries. And that, uh, in terms of com Drupal Commerce, they, they made, I think, about five different libraries for things that could be useful outside of Drupal, like uh, address management, currency conversion, that sort of stuff that was just... And so they, what they've done is they've built those in standalone PHP and then open sourced those. And the intent for them was that other... PHP e-commerce frameworks could use those libraries, and that has started to happen. But because of that, this pattern has started to be adopted by other people, um, including ourselves, in that if you're building a module now, you can build sort of the, the logic of it in PHP and then wrap an actual Drupal module around it, either a Drupal 7 or Drupal 8 module, around that PHP, and that gives you much more flexibility. And that's what I'm calling here a uh, so you create your core functionality as a library, basically, and then you're wrapping a lightweight module around. And a, a really good example of this at the moment is we, we were commissioned by a company to build us, to build them a module for their service, a company called Search Metrics. But they wanted it in Drupal 7. So we knew, ultimately, they're going to want it in Drupal 8 as well. They just don't know it yet. 
Um, so we decided, rather than reinvent the wheel on this, we would, we would build the functionality of their integration in a, in a library and then wrap a Drupal 7 uh, module wrapper around it. And then we'll be able to do the same for Drupal 8 as soon as we, are, as soon as we find a spare five minutes, basically. But anyway, yeah. And what other people are doing that we've seen out there, um, for example, Search API or integration with Apache Solar isn't quite there. But there's a Symfony integration with Apache Solar. So what we have seen is that people are using that custom Symfony integration and then plumbing that into Drupal. So taking that opportunity with Symfony being there to utilize something that's outside of Drupal but bring it in, and that uh, takes away some of that dependency on the yeah, Drupal 8 country of not being quite ready. So yeah, I've covered that already. But so yeah, Drupal Commerce is a really good example. Search metrics that we're working on is, is another. So based on that potted history of what happened before, looking at the different approaches there are now, um, what this session really, for me, the message I want to bring to you is about how to make that decision. How to decide right now, if you were starting a project tomorrow, <coughs> do you do it in Drupal 7 or do you do it in Drupal 8? And that's a, that's a decision that I have to make, not every day, but very often. Um, so rather than it being an emotional decision, and you come to an event like this and you see all this cool Drupal 8 stuff, and the decision, you, you will walk away from this today and tomorrow and you'll be going, yeah, yeah, I want to get into Drupal 8. But in the world that I live in, I've got to think about risk, and I've got to think about risk versus reward. And I need to make a decision that's logical and not an emotional decision. So I'm not going to give you a, an answer here in this session today, but what I am going to give you is some things to think about that you may not, you may or may not be thinking about already. So what you're looking at are what are the requirements of your site? So do you, do you have the module, I mean this is the obvious thing, are the modules available that you need? So if they're not, then you're really not in a good position to start on Drupal 8. Simple. Have you got an upgrade path from Drupal 7 to 8? Or are you starting something new? Have you got a dev team that's trained in Drupal 8? Now a lot of uh, development teams are being, well, freaked out a little bit by the fact that we're going to be going to more object-oriented PHP. Um, so there is that side of things. There is a, there is a you know, whilst Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 on the surface look, look similar, under the hood they're quite a lot different. So have you got a development team there that, that's, that is ready to learn? And what's the type of client you're looking at? Are you looking at you know, a, a, a big sort of multinational who really don't, are look very risk averse? You know, insurance company, say? Or are you looking at a startup that just wants the new, coolest stuff? We've got to look at the community support cycle. We know that Drupal 6 support has come to an end, but Drupal 7 support will keep running and running until Drupal 9. And that's a good few years. So we've got to think about that as well. We've got to look at the timeline and the budget. Have you got two weeks to build this thing? Or have you got two months? And have you got the budget? Have you got the budget and the time to learn on the job? Now, if you're an agency, you probably don't because you know your client is not going to pay for you to figure this stuff out. But if it's an in-house development, maybe you've got more time, maybe, to actually spend a bit more time looking at this. Then we look at security. Are there any, uh, are there any implications of... Uh, this isn't so much the case now, but when I did the session originally, people were launching Drupal 8 sites when it was still in beta. And when it was still in beta, that meant the security team were not offering support for it. Therefore, you were putting yourself at big risk of security vulnerabilities that we didn't even know about yet. Um, do you need special functionality, i.e. have you got to do custom modules? Do your hosting, uh, do your hosting company support Drupal 8 yet? And is performance a big consideration for you? Um, what were the issues with performance? Um, mainly positive ones, 
in that Drupal 8 has a lot more performance optimization options available. So you might have seen sessions on Big Pipe earlier on uh, and that sort of thing. So if Drupal 8 is going to be able to give us better options on performance than Drupal 7 does. So if performance is your you know, number one issue with the project, then again, it's not a black and white, but it might inform that decision one way. So going into a bit more detail on these things, um, what type of site is it? Is it a small campaign? Is it something that's going to be, is it a burner site as we would call it? Is it something that's going to go up for a campaign that's going to last two months and then be taken down again? Or is it something that's going to be a five-year plan of rolling updates, lots of different sites being built? Yeah. So again, I'm not going to give you if it's this, it's Drupal 7, if it's that, it's Drupal 8. You need to make those decisions, but these are the things you need to think about. So in our case, we often build these multi-platform, multi-site platforms where we're looking at a long-term thing. So actually, in that case, we have to think strategically. So is the site you're about to build have a heavy reliance on community stuff? So we talked about Drupal Commerce and we talked about rules. If you're trying to build a Drupal Commerce site in Drupal 8 and you want to start on Monday, it's not happening. Sorry. <laughs> You've got Drupal Commerce is in Alpha 3. So no one's going to want to launch something on Alpha site. Well, some people do, but some people are crazy. Anyway, so... Um, Depending, if it's not commerce-based, uh, therefore, it, it changes your decision a little bit. So is it a greenfield? Is it a brand new site from the, from the ground up? Or is it something that's already in Drupal 6 or 7? Um, if it's in, you know, do we need to consider the migration path? Drupal 8 has migration in core now, whereas before that was very much a load of add-on modules. But it was added to core very late in the day, um, and it didn't have a UI in the initial release, so you really have to know what you're doing. Um, but it is still possible. Or is it a new build of, with content migration from an existing site? So th again, things to think about. So thinking, as we were just saying, about your dev team, what's your, what's your dev team experience? Now, some of the very, very early Drupal 8 sites. Now what you'll see is a lot of marketing, a lot of spin. We've done the first Drupal 8 site, we've done the this and that. And often what you'll find is that those companies have got a Drupal 8 core maintainer on staff. So they can take those kind of risks because they've got someone that can go in and fix it. Not everyone has that advantage. Have you got PHP developers that have got object-oriented program experience? Because they're going to need it to understand and a lot of the time, what we found is that Drupal developers aren't necessarily computer scientists. They're not necessarily classically trained programmers, and they may not have come across OOP before. Often, what they'll have done is learnt Drupal by example, by looking at modules, by figuring it out. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they're a bad developer. They can be an absolutely brilliant developer, but they might suddenly realise that, that you know, some of these paradigms of, of computer science that don't make sense and they'll need to relearn them. And the same with Symfony. Um, whilst it's not strict, you know, I think there was a lot of buzz when Symfony first came into Drupal that, oh, we're we all going to have to learn Symfony. I think, but when it's actually come down to it uh, in the Drupal 8 release, it's useful to have Symfony experience. It's useful to know what the Symfony components are, but actually it's not essential. Just like it wasn't ever essential in Drupal 7 to completely understand how it worked. As long as you understand enough for, for what you need, which is maybe doing Drupal uh, module development or so on. And I think it's the same for Drupal 8. You don't need to be a Symfony expert to do custom development in Drupal 8. It doesn't hurt, but you don't, you know, you don't need it necessarily. And what we've been doing um, at, uh, at ICOS is we're doing internal training about the different types of Symphony components, just so that we know what they are, what they are and what they're for. And as Steve did this course last week, um, it, and it's about just familiarising yourself with some of the terminology more than anything. <laughs> so yeah, then looking at your your risk profile of your client, are they in a highly regulated industry? Uh, in which case, they'll probably say everything has to have an official release. No alphas, no betas, no devs. Um, if it's a really high profile or high traffic site. Uh, the risk of something going wrong uh, could be quite catastrophic to your business. 
Um, or they're just generally risk averse, which many big companies will, will obviously be because you're talking about their brand. And the last thing they want to see is a white screen where their website should be. It's not saying that Drupal 8 involves white screens, but I'm just saying that, you know, that, that's, that's it. It's, it's the, the difference between something new and something tried and trusted. So we're expecting Drupal 7 support to be at least three years. We don't know what it really is, but from past experience, it's probably going to be that. So if the site we're building is, is like I said before, a promo site, a throwaway, a burner, or it's a two-year... A lot of people build sites that last three years. It seems to be a bit of a pattern in the, in the industry now because by the time three years have gone by, um, you know, there's new trends uh, or you've got a new management team. You want to do it all again. Um, but three years is, is quite a common life cycle for a site. Um, and in which case, you know, three years, three years support, what do you do? Abigail, can you afford to learn on the job? There's no question about it. If you, the moment you start Drupal 8, and this is, this is what we experienced in Drupal 7, it was very, very painful getting up to speed. It's going to be the same with Drupal 8, when you start, you know, the core stuff is going to be fine. It's much, much better, better UX and everything else. But when it comes to doing custom development, we've got to relearn our process a little bit. So for a certain period of time, a few months maybe, it's just going to take a little bit longer. And you're doing that on your own time or your client's time. So site building will be definitely better. Configuration management will be definitely be better. Um, but if you've got an existing, for example, an existing install profile that you always use for your site, then obviously you need to change it and update it for Drupal 8. So there's a bit of pro and con there. Some things, like you won't have to mess with features so much, and that is pretty time-consuming stuff. Config management is going to make that much faster. So you, can you trade that time saving off against the slightly longer time it might take you to do custom modules at this point? So going back through my old slides, I was managed to, to update them last night and say, yeah, actually, that we don't have to worry about this anymore. The security policy of the Drupal security team is to only support uh, betas. Uh, there was a bug bounty program going on at the time, but now we know that there are Drupal 8 security releases coming out and it's fully supported by the security team. So that's good. We can take that one off the list now. And the next one is about special functionality, I call it, but stuff that you might not do every day. Um, multilingual sites, obviously uh, in Drupal 8, all of the multilingual stuff was built in, whereas before it used to be a hodgepodge of things that we had to join together. So if you're doing a multilingual site, it's going to be significantly easier to do in Drupal 8 than Drupal 7. Doing integrations with APIs externally, again, Drupal has been reworked in Drupal 8 to be much more friendly for that kind of application. So if you are, for example, building a data store that's going to tie into a mobile app or something like that, then Drupal 8 is a much better option for you. And having built a few of these in Drupal 7, you know, it's, it can be quite, quite, a, quite a process. And then the configuration workflow. If that is really important to you, if that locking down that configuration in the environment is really important, then configuration management is a massive step forward over features. And again, when I wrote this, not everyone was supporting Drupal 8. I don't think uh, at the time I did this at Queer weren't doing Drupal 8 support. Of course they are now. Um, so, but if you're not on Aqua and you're not on Pantheon, you're not on Platform or any of these uh, well-known uh, hosting layers, do do that. Do those. Do use, does your hosting provider support what we need? Does it support the memory? Does it support the PHP version, and so on? Because I, well, I haven't got any evidence so much, but it's like if you're trying to put this on a shared hosting platform on Fasthost or something, is it going to work for you compared to Drupal 7? And then performance. So performance is a massive step up. So uh, there was a session on BigPipe this morning, which was very, very interesting. Um, but caching and just cache tags and very more, much more intelligent caching than we've ever had before is available in Drupal 8 now. So that's a massive step up. Uh, especially for caching in authenticated traffic. So people who are logged in, you're seeing it much, much better. Something that we really can't achieve in Drupal 7 uh, is this high performance sort of logged in traffic. 
and then we've got the base theme. So there aren't that many base themes in Drupal 8, and that's a little bit surprising, but there may be more now. But there was a completely rethinking of theming in Drupal, which has always been a little bit controversial, how, how, how difficult it is to theme in Drupal 7. So Drupal 8 has switched to this uh, to Twig, which is a Symfony-based thing, and it uses much more uh, logical HTML markup rather than lots of PHP going on. And that makes it much, much more accessible to front-enders who are not specifically Drupal trained. And we certainly, um, within our group, we have lots of front-enders that haven't done Drupal before, and we're very much looking forward to them being able to work with us more on sites without having to have a Drupal backend sitting next to them, holding their hand, uh, helping them through. So you've got these stable and classy core themes, which uh, our friend Morton has uh, introduced into the system, which allow us to <coughs> um, basically give us a really clean place to start and base our own theme on top of. So I, I would uh, strongly advise you to watch any of those the sessions on those uh, that, that are very, very interesting. So it's not so much of a problem that we don't have that many base themes in Drupal 8 because what we've got in core is a really, really good place to start. What happened there? <laughs> ah, right. So putting it in a different way, as of today, on the, right, on the left hand side here we've got a very simple site, maybe a marketing site, all the way up to a really complex platform. And on this direction, we've got the risk, so high risk. So at the moment, if you're looking at maybe an internal project where no one's going to scream and shout, uh, maybe it's a, a simple kind of brochure site, then you're in the safe zone down here. If you're up here, slightly more complex site that's got multilingual requirements, maybe APIs, maybe some symphony or advanced caching, it's complex, but you're going to be better off in Drupal 8 because of all these things that we now have. If you're over here, you're in the slightly unknown risky zone because if you've got a very high profile client, re maybe regulated, maybe you're using panels, who knows? This is risky here. And at the top, you're in the real high risk area because you're a, you're, if you needed to build a Drupal Commerce site in 8 tomorrow, you're going to have to be dependent on that roadmap and the alpha version, which might be fine for what you're doing, but the risk is or higher. So it's, as I said, head versus heart. Make the logical decision. And what I advise you do is can use the materials in this presentation to do yourself a pros and cons list, just like you do for any big life decision. Um, make a list of those criteria and look how important each one is to you. And then potentially add the complexity scoring if you want to go really complicated and do it on a spreadsheet. Put this slide in there. I'm trying to decide whether I should have done all that anyway. But yeah, let's throw it out there. So, any of you actually working on Drupal 8 site at the moment, at the back there? <laughs> at the moment, anyone working on a commercial Drupal 8 site? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, my, my last couple of slides actually. If you're thinking about it, these reasons. Everyone else is doing it. That's what you'll hear this week. If I don't, oh no, I'm going to be left behind. The community is going to go racing off and I won't be in it. I've got clients that are saying, yeah, yeah, we want Drupal 8. <laughs> it's the latest thing. I want to do it. We can learn it as we go along. It's fine. We know some symphony. We've done a bit of that. We'll be all right. Oh, that's all anyone's talking about. Every session here is about Drupal 8. Mm -hmm. Drupal 7 is obsolete. We don't want that anymore. And one direct quote from someone in my office, Twig looks cool. <laughs> None of these are a good reason to do Drupal 8. All right? None of those are a good reason. So that's the emotional stuff. That's the stuff that can lead you down the wrong path. Now, I, I absolutely want to get stuck into Drupal 8 for all of those reasons. But that's not the reason to make a commercial decision. And this one is the takeaway for me. A failed Drupal 8 site is bad for all of us. You know, we're in this community together, and any Drupal 8 failure 
um, reflects on all of us because the next client that comes along says, oh, well, I heard about that company there, they had Drupal 8 and it was a disaster. So whilst you'll see a lot of people and a lot of marketing and even our own marketing saying, yeah, we're Drupal 8 ready, we're Drupal 8 ready, but the right project <laughs> needs to be Drupal 8 ready. So I think, I don't know, I don't want to be, to bring, it, bring the day on a downer, but I just want every project to be successful. I want Drupal 8 to be successful and I don't want us to make the wrong decisions right now um, that, that we rush this. And it might be that in a month, no month is the right time. And it completely depends on the project. It might be that last week is the right time. And we are building Drupal 8 projects ourselves. So, you know, I'm not, as I say, I'm not completely writing it off at this point. Um, but it's just making that decision, thinking about your project and not getting carried away and thinking that you can't keep doing Drupal 7. All right, so I'm also not saying go and use Backdrop, but you know, it, it's, it's making that sensible decision um, for the right reasons. And that decision is going to change on a week by week basis. So it's keeping an eye on that, on the ecosystem that's around us. And then, yeah, so what do you do next? And then I'll do the shameless plug stuff. <laughs> So we've got a couple of books out. Yeah, this one, this one's just come out. So this, this is an illustration, really, of um, you know, Drupal 8. We, we spent two years writing this Drupal 8 book. Um, because Drupal 8's been such a long, drawn-out process for us all, we had to spend two years writing a book about it because every time we thought we were done, something changed. So we had to do it again. Um, but that's out now. We were giving some away. I don't know if there's any left, but anyway. Um, so yeah, Drupal 8. Uh, that is a book about learning Drupal 8. It's not a hardcore developer's book. It's more about introducing you to Drupal from the very beginning and taking you through. So, shameless plug over. That's me. Um, if you've got any questions, I'd be very, very happy to hear about them. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm really surprised about Teams that they have going there. I was assuming that Teams would be They are, yeah. Um, but when, when, for example, we were writing that chapter of the book, we were like, okay, let's pick some well-known themes, and they just weren't there. Um, and that may have changed now that we've stabilised a little bit. But the the issue, to be honest, Drupal isn't like some other technology, some other things like WordPress. Say, there's not that much of a, a marketplace for themes and stuff because there's no way really to monetize it that well. So there's not, whereas WordPress, you, you can get thousands of themes and just download them and plug them in. You don't really have that as much in Drupal. You do a bit, but not so much. Well, the so. themes that are being sold, are they all going to be repository? Do they have to be somewhere? Yeah. They, don't, they don't have to be, but anyone who's doing stuff like that <laughs> would. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I know. That's mm. what I'm saying. The inside is... So many Drupal 7s are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you'd, be, you'd be very unlikely you'd find one uh, that wasn't. But generally, we use themes to build on top. So it's very unlikely that we're going to down, in our line of work anyway, that we're going to download a, a theme either from a community or a marketplace and use it as it is. Most of the time, we use themes to build our client's brand on top of. So, so that feeds into like what you were saying earlier about, um, about like developers having to take longer mm -hmm. sort of, you know, if you're, if you're working on a project, it's going to take you longer I've been looking at the, the theme system like the last couple of weeks, and for me, as like a front ender, I think that Drupal is going to be significantly quicker. So there's going to be time yes. savings as well as absolutely. Uh, and and with that as well, I was looking because I always use the Amiga base thing mm -hmm. to do all of my theming, and I, I was doing the same thing, was scratching around, thinking, well, why isn't this here? And then when I actually looked into what Morton has done with the with theme classy system, and stable, now, yeah, it's, it's almost like it, it's but well, for me anyway, it's just not necessary yeah. because the, the, the base theme in core is doing everything. You know, if you're designing from scratch, then you don't need anything other than what's in core, really. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and that was the point I was, yeah, I was had up there. It's that, yeah, you don't need those, those support things anymore. Um, and, yeah, there are definitely some areas, as I said, configuration management, yeah. theming, that are just going to get easier mm. and they're going to be quicker. And therefore, maybe depending on the type of work, that outweighs the fact that custom module development for a couple of months might take a bit longer. Yeah. 
And that's what it's all about. It's figuring that calculation out, um, depending on how, again, calculating the risk. Because the worst thing is you, you, know, you, you say, right, I'm going to build this. It's going to take me two days, based on my experience, or two weeks, and it takes you ten. And then everyone's in trouble. So, you know, it, it's just that transition. That, that's where we are right now. And it's, it's that uncomfortable bit. And you, you feel like you're being left behind. You think, every, you think that everyone you talk to is doing Drupal 8. I'm not so sure. So we'll be doing it. We'll, we'll say we're doing our own sites, our own internal projects. And, and as, you know, again, depending on, there's, there's a couple of commercial projects that we're looking at at the moment that where Drupal 8 makes sense for many of these reasons. So, yeah, we're cracking on with it. But it, as I say, it's just about balancing it up. Yes, yeah, sure. It's all right. So, display suite, yeah. Yeah, display suite is one of the ones that is in a good state for Drupal 8. I think so, yes. Yeah, paragraphs we use. Uh, display suite is usable for sure. Um, as I say, commerce is, is in pretty good shape, but it's just the, the community bit of commerce that needs to be caught up, including some of the modules that I look after. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> any others? I've got a question you might not know the answer to it, um, but I heard that Path Auto might be making it into core for 8.1. Is that, is that something? I don't know. I hope so. Yeah. Because, again, that was a nice little... When we, we did one chapter in the book was about essential contrib stuff, yeah. and Path Auto was number one, and it just didn't bloody work. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I hope so. I, I think it, I'm surprised it didn't make it. It, it would make sense. Yeah. I don't know any site that exactly. Yeah, I was very surprised when we were working on, on 8.0 that it wasn't there. Um, but yeah, if, even so, the, the, the module for Parcel is in good shape. So that's, that's one blocker out of the way, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, number one. <laughs> when you think your graph of the top right, uh, red. Yeah. Which one? That one. For commerce, I think rules is, um, you know, there's some things you can get around. You might not need to do migration at all. You might, and 8.1 has got that, missed the bit of migration that missed out on 8.0. Um, rules dependency, again, they've built the guts of it, but they haven't built the UI. So that doesn't mean you can't use it, it's just going to be a bit more fiddly. And commerce is rocking away towards Alpha 3 now. Um, I don't know whether, I think they might be aiming for New Orleans as a full release, um, but there's three developers dedicated to that um, on the, the reformed commerce guys, if you know any of the history around that, um, who are working very hard to, to get that out there. Um, so, I don't know, I, I, I'm expecting, to be honest with you, the types of stuff that we do six months after release is what we did in Drupal 7. And I expect it will be about the same, which is only maybe two months away, right? So it's not it's not far. When I wrote this, it was November last year, and now we're we're in a different place. So I'm every day, every new project that we look at, the the scales tip closer to here. Well, uh, again, it, that that very much depends on the life cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it, it really depends, and, and it depends on the client, because the client might, if the client is knowledgeable in Drupal, then they're going to say, well, what are you doing building this Drupal 7 site? And that, that's why, it was one of my reasons. Don't necessarily take that as the only reason to do it in Drupal 8. Um, you can have that conversation for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. It's also quite high maintenance. I built my own, rebuilt my own website in Drupal 8 as a project. And I started using uh, picture, responsive picture, with display suite. And display suite is, of course, a picture. Mm -hmm. And 
they might have to do these upgrades as different modules went and, you know, the devs went up and mm -hmm. alphas and betas went up, and suddenly it worked. It will, exactly. It just Everything. Out that they, suddenly it was a responsive yeah. feature. It was there. Well, I would just definitely say keep an eye on that lightning distro yeah. because those modules that have been selected by John and his team um, are the ones that, you know, Acquia obviously looking at loads and loads of sites. So they're the ones that they know uh, they've put the focus on the money into. So if there's modules in there, yeah, most likely the ones you're looking for are going to be the ones in that big 50. So keep an eye on that, is what I would say. And the moment that goes from beta to full release, it's probably the day you ring the bell and say, right, that's it, and everything's now green, let's go for it. So is that being released as part of a distribution? It's already, in, it's already out there, yeah, right. under project slash lightning. Can you tell us more about it? Maybe? No, you don't know anything about it? Yeah, that's <laughs> it. That's <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm going to. yeah. So I'm, I'm keeping a very close eye on that. Um, I have like a, a, a list of my top 20 or 30 modules that I'm waiting for. And, and then I'll look at that distro and go, oh yeah, and that one. And, uh, but I can see that that's where the effort's going. Things like Path Auto. So, yeah. All right. Well, it's been a, a long day social time. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming in. Great.